How many things have to be wrong to make it stop working? Any one of thousands of things. Take a needle, stick it through two spark plug wires, trim it off, rough up the rubber. They'll never find that one. <laughs> Pull the distributor cap, take a pencil, rub it around, put it back. That's a tough one to find. When somebody's getting married, pull out the coil wire, stick a doorbell wire in there, shove it back, take the doorbell wire through the firewall, and weave it through the fabric of the front seat. <laughs> They're getting ready to go on their honeymoon, you know, hit that, bam, ooh, wow. Oh. <laughs> Don't get me started, we can go for hours, I like working on cars. <laughs> Folks, complex things require a designer. And yet they tell the kids that humans and chimpanzees are similar. There are thousands of differences. But even if there are some similarities, so what? If you think the percentage of similarity proves something, let me show you the research I've been doing. I've discovered that clouds are 100% water. Watermelons are 97%. Only 3% difference. That proves watermelons evolved from clouds. <laughs> and I discovered jellyfish are 98% water. And... So are snow cones. <laughs> that proves how they evolved. Mm -hmm. Then they sell the kids, fossils prove evolution. This textbook says, fossils provide evidence of evolution. This is a lie. No fossil counts as evidence for evolution. But the textbook here says, evolution is a fact. The fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. There is no fossil record. You don't look back in the fossil record, you look at fossils. You put your interpretation on them, okay? They don't have a date with them in a card that says this one was, you know, made 47 million years ago. There is no such thing as a fossil record. How do we fall for such a dumb idea? But the textbooks are always saying fossils can contribute to the understanding of evolution. Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless and immediate fossils must have existed. Boy, there must be a bunch of them out there. I agree, Charlie, there ought to be a whole bunch. This book says, since Darwin, many links have been found. Well, they're dreaming. David Ropp, who has a huge fossil collection, American Museum of Natural History, I believe, or Field Museum in Chicago, I forget which one he works at, I think it's New York. He said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions, you know, missing links. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, fantasy in the textbooks? you got to be kidding. Oh, no. Evolution is based on fantasy. We could spend hours talking about there are no missing links. There just aren't, folks. These quotes are all on our website about how evolution is not supported by fossils. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. <laughs> you can't prove it had any kids. And you sure can't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone from the dirt can do something animals today can't do? Hey, they say we evolved from an ape-like ancestor. Okay, apes are still having babies. Let's, let's do it again. I want to see it this time. We don't observe any evolution. Luther Sunderland wrote to major evolutionists all over and said, Hey, where's the evidence for evolution? I want to see it. They all wrote back and said, We don't have it. Somebody else has it. Colin Patterson has the access to the largest fossil collection in the world. British Museum, Natural History. Patterson wrote a book about evolution. So Luther read the book and said, Hey, I read your book, Mr. Patterson, but you didn't show us any missing links. Where are they? Patterson said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. See, folks, there's not a missing link. The whole chain is missing. So they got a new theory now to explain why they're missing. Stephen Gould said the absence of fossil evidence is a nagging problem for evolution. He knows there's no evidence for evolution, so he's got a new theory. He kind of brought up Goldschmidt's old theory that said maybe the first bird hatched from a reptile egg. Do what? He says, yeah, you know, maybe evolution happened so quickly that there's no evidence. Oh, well, that's good, you know. We don't have any proof, so that proves it. <laughs> Try that one in a court of law, see how far you get. They tell the kids to think critically. 
Boys and girls, the fossil record shows that an organism evolved through many small changes over time. That's a lie, by the way. Which theory best describes organism's evolution? Gradualism or punctuated equilibria? How do you think it happened, boys and girls? Was it slow changes like Darwin said, or was it jumps like Stephen Gould said? In their mind, there's only two choices. Evolution happened slowly or evolution happened quickly. They do not seem to be capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen at all. God created the different kinds. I debated Pigliucci at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Doc, I debated him twice. I don't know if he'd do it again. I'd be glad to, by the way, Doc. If you get ready, get brave enough, let me know. Uh, I said, Dr. Pigliucci, you have studied and taught courses on the evolution of plants for 10 years. You received and spent $650,000 in grant money to study the evolution for plants. What is the best evidence you know of for evolution? I asked him that in the debate. He said, the evolution of whales. <laughs> Just exactly what kind of plant is a whale anyway, hmm? <laughs> He told me the hippo is evidence for evolution because it's in the process of adapting to an aquatic way of life. It likes the water, so that's proof for evolution. He said the flying squirrel is evidence because it has half a wing. He gets tax dollars to, to teach. See, every evolutionist I've talked to thinks that the evidence is in somebody else's field. It's like a shell game. You ever seen those shell games? You know, they put the pea down there and try to get you mixed up. Where's the pea? The geologist thinks that the biologist has the evidence. Pigliucci is a botanist. He thinks that, you know, the anthropologist or somebody else has the evidence. They're all spreading their blame. The only problem is there's no pea under any of them. There is no evidence for evolution. None. They tell the kids, we've got evidence from the horse evolution. This is a bunch of baloney. They arranged a bunch of animals in a fictitious order. It's been proven wrong 50 years ago. They don't tell the kids that the so-called ancient horse had 18 pairs of ribs, the next one had 15, the next one had 19, then back to 18. These are not even the same animal. It's a pure imagination arrangement of these creatures. They're teaching this in textbooks all over the world. There's quite a variety of horses today, folks. Big ones and little ones right now. But back in 1950, G.G. G. Simpson, who believed in evolution, said this evolution of the horse family was unintentionally falsified. The evolution of the horse was all wrong. Over 50 years ago, it's proven wrong. It never happened in nature. Why do they keep putting it in the books? They say this example of the horse evolution has not held up under close examination. Othniel Marsh made up this whole idea in 1874. He wanted to provide evidence for Darwin's theory. He picked animals from all over the world and put them in order he thought they would look good. It's imagination. Modern horses have been found in the same layers and lower than the so-called ancient horse. The ancient horse is not a horse at all. It's a hierasotherum. It's like the hyrax, still alive in Turkey and East Africa today. The ribs, toes, and teeth are different on these animals. In South America, the fossils go backwards, the wrong way. They don't talk about that. They're never found in the order presented. The whole thing is imagination. But it still is taught in the books to help give the kids evidence for evolution. The Tulsa Zoo finally took down their display after Dan Hicks wrote letters. Here's the letters right here. He wrote letters to the Tulsa Zoo and said, Why do you still have the evolution of the horse on display? And they wrote back and said, we don't have the funding to remove it. <laughs> Come read the letters. Dan went and got a bid at a sign shop. Here's the bid right here. They said, we will put up a sign that says, this, evolution, this display is not correct, and we'll take it down as soon as we get enough money. 62 bucks for the sign. So Dan went and said, hey, here's the quote, fellas. I'll pay the 62 bucks. When would you like the sign delivered? Nothing happened. They said, we've got to take this to the board. Well, the board got bored because they never did anything. Finally, he collected 2,000 signatures and said, get this display out of our zoo. When it made the evening news that the Tulsa Zoo was lying to the kids coming through, the display was gone the next day. <laughs> but I just found out recently, they put it back up. What's a zoo doing teaching evolution anyway? See, the evolutionists are pushing their religion at every tax-funded opportunity they can get. Peabody Museum still has the horse evolution on display. 
I stood there by that display as hundreds of kids came through. Stood there for quite a while. School group after school group after school group came through. Was never told this was proven wrong 50 years ago. You go get the textbooks used in your county schools or your city schools. It's still in there, folks. It's not true. That page ought to be torn out of the book. Just because you can arrange animals in order doesn't prove a thing. Even if you find them buried in a certain order, that doesn't prove a thing. If I get buried on top of a hamster, does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> I've been doing ev a lot of research on the evolution of the fork. I've pieced together fragmentary evidence for years. I believe after intensive research, the knife evolved first and then slowly evolved to the spoon. Took millions of years. You know, great geological pressure squeezed it, <coughs> dished it out, widened it up a little bit. And then slowly, erosion cut grooves into the end and turned it into the short time fork. And then very slowly, over millions of years, the grooves got longer and wider. I knew I had the right order, but I felt like I had a missing link, particularly between spoons and forks. You see, spoons are rounded and no grooves. Forks are squared and grooved. That's two jumps in one. Even punctuated equilibrium can't do that. So I knew I had a missing link here, folks, but I couldn't find it. Till one day I'm flying in the airplane on U.S. Air, 30,000 feet off the ground, and the stewardess walked down the aisle and handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had. <laughs> but my trained scientific eye picked it up. I said, this is it. Later that day I went to get some chicken for lunch and found another one. There they are, folks. The missing links. So the evolution of silverware is becoming very complete. <laughs> I have found a lot of evidence since then. I've been gathering data on this for a long time. I even found a few mutants along the way. <laughs> Didn't quite make it for some reason. You know, it was very interesting though. As soon as people found out I was doing research on the evolution of the fork, everybody wanted to become famous. They sent me all their data from all over the country. Even some lies got sent to me, folks. I mean, some people just, they just want to be famous. This one is an obvious fork head on a spoon handle. <laughs> it didn't get by me, though. This is a cutthroat business. This fossil business is dangerous, you know. You've got to watch them. But I caught it right away. That didn't, it's not in my museum. The rest of them are, though. Even found that environmental pressures can cause all sorts of colors to arise over millions of years. Now, look, you can arrange letters in order and try to prove something if you want. You can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog making one letter change at a time. If you play around for a while, you can turn yourself into a fool. <laughs> Doesn't take long either. Now they tell the kids dinosaurs turn to birds. Yeah. The Bible says the birds are made on day five, right? <laughs> Reptiles made on day six. Evolution has it backwards. Everything about the evolution theory is backwards to the Bible. And why some Christians try to compromise the two, I don't know. But they don't blend together. The scientist says, dinosaurs alive as birds. Scientist says, oh, wow, scientist says, it must be true. Wow, scientist says, you know, bow down, everybody. <laughs> this is absurd, okay? 1999, USA Today announced, missing link of birds is discovered. National Geographic, missing link, breaking news. We got it, folks. A huge article on how dinosaurs turn to birds. A couple of months later, uh, oops, fellas, we got lied to. Somebody in China made the fossil. It's a fake. We could spend hours talking about this, the dinosaur to bird. All those fossils coming out of China are real suspect. Those guys make, you know, $3 a year if they work real hard. What if you work two years and make one fossil you can sell to the Smithsonian for $4 million? You and your whole family are set for life. <laughs> and somebody over here is dumb enough to buy it. These guys say this bird evolution is silly. They say birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. In case you don't know, there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird. You don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, give it a try. It won't hurt too bad. <laughs> you see, birds have feathers. They have two legs and two wings. Reptiles have four perfectly good legs. If he's going to evolve to a bird, somewhere along the line, 